All right, what up, brothers and sisters? This is the other Paul, and we're here for a very nice and very informative stream where I even whip out the whiteboard like a true teacher slash lecturer. And hopefully, I'm hoping this one's not gonna, it's not gonna actually be too long, <coughs> which I normally say um, at the beginning of a stream that goes for around two and a half or three hours. But for real this time, I'm intending this one not to be too long because it's not very complicated. I'm gonna be just just presenting something very simple and really just as a pretext to virtually all future discussions on the issue of solo scriptura, um, magisterium, church tradition, and well, yeah, those, those, those types of issues of authority in general. It's really going to be a pretext to all those. And I really hope it's a solid contribution for us prots uh, in order to get some more solid, uh, solid footing in addressing Roman Catholic and Orthodox claims on authority. And so, yeah, it's just going to be establishing my definition of what I call ecclesialism. It's really something that Protestants have used, um, the, the idea as making it a conceptual system comparable with Sola Scriptura, but like not consistently and not very explicitly. And so that's what I want to do, create an explicit um, term and category for the authority system that Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, and other sects uh, claim as their thing, something that's comparable to Sola Scriptura, so that uh, arguments about Sola Scriptura can likewise be measured against the the system that Rome and the East themselves propose, so that, you know, we're doing equal weights and measures, because what if an argument they're presenting against Sola Scriptura would be just as, if not more, devastating for their own system, or even if not to the same level, still a problem for their system? That's a very valid thing that we need to be able to do in order to um, force some consistency. If that is the case, in order to force consistency on those who uh, those who critique Protestantism, quote unquote, in sola scriptura. And I'll see who's here. Particular psalmody. This is uh, concerning. My mouth is literally watering. Watering. No, just kidding. That's that's very very base. This is going to be a good stream indeed. A good presentation. What up? What up? What up, dweeb? I love my dweeb here. Good to see you, buddy. JH. Good to see you as well, there, man. And anyone else here, make yourself known in the live chat. We are happening right now. And I just put up a basic list of what I'm going to do uh, today. So pretty much pretext. So the pretext of all this is, as I just said, actually, no, before I do that, I need to acknowledge my supporters. Let me share the Kensus Patronorum. I need to come up with a better way of doing it because it looks like it looks like so gay and rough with the windows, like the windows photos window. And yet it has this nice little scroll, with this nice aesthetic. I got I got to change it. So I got to somehow be able to show a PD, a, a PNG without the background, but whatever, whatever. Thank you all so much. Financial supporters. I love you guys. You are, Oh crap. I forgot to update it. I for, I for, Fezzik. I'm sorry. I forgot to, I forgot to put you from Diakonos to Episcopos, but I just, just recognize people. Fezzik is now Episcopos. Absolute legend. Thank you so much. And, uh, thank you all supporters for being a supporter. It's absolutely legendary. Helps me make this possible, higher quality content, more frequency, and helps me turn this into a job. And so if you want to support me, you believe there's value in what I'm doing, and you fit the other criteria, which I mentioned 12,000 other times, you um, you are financially stable and you're supporting your church one way or another, then please consider becoming a supporter. Subscribe star down below. Thank you all. Now, let's acknowledge the others here. Uh, Thesirovin. I'm trying to say that consistently. Thesirovin. 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 I don't know if the emphasis is right, but that's that's what it seems to me. Good to see you. Josh, my latest supporter. What up, mate? Glad to see you here. Jeff, hello. And Evan, good to see you as well. I don't think I've seen you before, Evan. Uh, maybe I have. Not sure. There's just that many people that I don't think I'll remember everyone. Anyway, pretext, as I mentioned it, is the apologetics and polemics between us, Protestants, Roman Catholics, and Eastern Orthodox. Very often in their, not always, not always, but very often in their critiques of Sola Scriptura, they will compare. Oh yes, true that Tato, Blessed Trinity Sunday. Well, it's it's Monday in the in the canonical time zone of Australian Eastern Standard Time. It is Monday, so you're one day late, brother. I'm sorry, <laughs> but yes, very often Roman Catholics and Orthodox in their polemics against Sola Scriptura, they'll compare it with their church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, the Roman Catholic Church, and all that. And the problem with that, and th this is actually something I saw um, with like with with Trent Horn's response. That's that's actually kind of what I did. 
um, albeit more so with Protestantism, not strictly just Sola Scriptura, but end up being the same thing where they'll compare Protestantism to Roman Catholicism or Sola Scriptura to Roman Catholicism or the church or whatever. And the problem with it is that it's quite, it's quite simple. These are totally different kinds of categories. Sola Scriptura is a very simple premise of authority, whereas Roman Catholicism or the Eastern Orthodox Church, they are full-fledged ecclesial bodies uh, with a full system of theology and all that jazz. So these are simply not the same thing. To, to, to level, to compare them to one another is not, is not fair. And so one thing you can do is to compare denomination to denomination or communion to communion. So let's say, for example, the Roman Catholic, the, the, the those under the communion with the Pope of Rome uh, versus those under the Anglican communion. That's, that's a fair comparison. Those are, those are two distinct categories. Or the Roman Catholic denomination specifically, because there's Eastern Catholics and Maronites who are, who are under the communion of Rome, but there's a specific dom- denomination you can kind of point out. Um, the Roman Catholic denomination with, let's say... Um, Let's say this, the Anglican Church of Australia as a specific de- denomination, if you will. So that's that's one way you can have a fair comparison. But another way you can, and in my opinion, the more revealing one, is to compare system to system. So in this case, it would be sola scriptura for us Protestants. That scripture is the is the sole brackets, and I'll explain why later. Uh, infallible rule of faith versus what I. Uh, coin as ecclesialism. That is that scripture plus apostolic tradition plus the church magisterium are the sole brackets, infallible rules of faith. Those are comparable categories. These are comparable systems. And so that's where a fair dialogue can occur. And likewise, it allows us Protestants, because we've really, we've really neglected to do this. And yet it's really, we really, really should start doing it. It allows us to weigh the arguments that Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox bring against Sola Scriptura and weigh it against their own system. This isn't, this isn't just to be a bare two quoque of saying, oh, well, you too, your, your, uh, your system fails against your argument, therefore your argument is false. No, that's not what it is. Whether the argument's true or not, this is to simply show the Roman Catholic, look, if you want to assert this argument, uh, as- assuming it does work against their system as well, just to say to them, look, if you want to assert this argument, it's going to destroy your own system as well. So do, are you really that confident that your argument is true or are you going to try and consider that maybe there's some ways out of it? Maybe it actually doesn't work after all. Because once you so show someone that an argument they present goes against their system, it will, uh, can, it will force them to consider maybe it's not true. So this thing that I'm doing here is it, it's, it's, it's somewhat um, intellectual, argue, argumentative and all that stuff. But it's also somewhat psychological. I'm not going to shy away from that. And I think it's a good thing uh, as a psychological tactic to show um, if it's successful, to show Romanists and Easterners that their own arguments will destroy their own system. Um, and so and so to get them to open up to a greater charity of considering that maybe their arguments aren't so airtight or definitive as they claim. And so I think that's a that's this is a great way to go about with this. And more people coming in. How good. Occasional big ups in the chat for the Anglican Alcuin of York for creating the Liturgy for Trinity Sunday. Well, there you go. There's some history. I don't know about, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I don't know much about that. Um, like the Black Doctor, Ayo. What up, man? Oh, that nice, that nice Calvin with aviators. How good. Alex Warsler. Good to see you, brother. Feeding my cows and listening to this. This is the peak of human perfection. It's the spot right there. For me, it's listening to a podcast or a documentary. Um, while eating some like charcoal chicken or takeaway. The Syravan, two Korkwe aren't necessarily aren't inherently invalid. Peter Gage explains it the way you did, the fact that some beliefs are inconsistent and must abandon one of them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's what I mean. So uh, I'm not so what I'm what I'm wanting to say is I'm not using a two Korkwe fallacy, right? In saying that your argument defeats your system, therefore you're wrong, but simply you may just want to reconsider it. You you can't hold both of these arguments together. And so yeah. Recent Presby follower, first time commenter, love your stuff. Why, thank you very much. Love me, fellow Presbys. How good. Love it, love it, love it. So that's the that's the pretext there. And I, well, yeah, I, also, I guess I also explained why comparing Sola Scriptura to Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy doesn't work as well, because these are full ecclesial bodies versus Sola Scriptura, which is a simple premise. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we move on to the next phase of our argument, which means 
turning the camera over to the whiteboard, ladies and gentlemen. That's right. We've got the whiteboard right here. Let me move it up. Ah, perfect. It's nice and visible. Close the window, I guess. And the door, actually. There we go. Nice and visible. How good. Oh, except for the, okay, the computer screen's a bit bright, but whatever. <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to deal with that some other way one day. So I think, okay, for future reference, I'm probably going to get the stand because um, I have this, my camera comes with this little stand that I can put it there so I don't have to move the camera. And, but if it comes to putting the camera back on top of the monitor is an absolute pain in the ass, but whatever, whatever. So let's move the mic over here. Hopefully I can be heard nice and well. Let's line this a little bit better. Like that. That, sh that should work. I think you guys can see that fine. I think this works. And seeing the comments now, people people loving this. To to quote not being a fallacy is a real fallacy is based. <laughs> true that, true that. Whiteboard time. Wow, the other board is lit. <laughs> is it just the whiteboard or is it a doctor whiteboard? <laughs> bruh, bruh, so true. Like literally just with this basic whiteboard over here. My content has ascended light years ahead of every other niche Christian micro celebrity content maker because, like, it's real, it's tangible. Eventually, I want to get to the level of Dr. White himself where he has the full on interactive digital whiteboard. I want to get one of those one day, but they're very expensive. Let me just move the camera a little bit up. All right, this is all nice and visible. Okay, cool. So, what do we got here? I'm comparing the systems here, Sola Scriptura and Ecclesialism. Although I kind of want to start reframing this to be scripturalism, and I'll explain why in just a second. But the basic premises of both of each system are this. Scripture is the sole brackets infallible rule of faith. That's Sola Scriptura, all right? Ecclesialism, scripture plus tradition plus the church magisterium are the soul brackets infallible rules of faith. Now, why have I put soul in brackets here? Because I believe it's important we recognize there's different ways we can frame, to start with soul scriptura, because that's normally, that's normally how it's defined, the soul infallible rule of faith. You can, if you want, just get rid of the soul entirely. Uh, should I erase it? I won't erase it yet. You can, if you want get rid of the soul and simply say scripture is the infallible rule of faith. Well, the difference with it, there's technically not a difference in substance, but when you have soul in there, that's a much more explicit affirmation of rejecting other systems, which makes sense because historically that's what Sola Scriptura did. It explicitly rejected the infallibility of the Pope, for example. So in light of that, if we want to make it less negative and more just a pure positive affirmation, we can simply say scripture is the infallible rule of faith. And likewise, we can do so with ecclesialism, whereas it would normally say uh, scripture plus tradition plus the magisterium are the infallible rules of faith. They could likewise, in rejection to, let's say, someone who asserts that their personal musings on the, on the, on the nature of the universe are infallible, they could likewise frame it as saying, that scripture tradition and the church are the sole infallible rules of faith. So we can kind of swap these between, but it's a good way to frame this, to have the soul in brackets so that we can allow the two concepts to remain perfectly equal in terms of comparability. <clears throat> now, uh, the first thing I want to define, actually, I could have been on my notes again. It says, let's see, define rule. Okay, so just to be nice and autistically detailed by rule of faith. I define that specifically. Let me bring it up. I define rule of faith specifically as a source, which we can consistently discern and access at will for divine truth. So technically just with the basic term, we could say that the Holy spirit himself is a rule of faith or really the ultimate rule of faith, but that's not in the same category as when we're talking about scripture or the church or sacred tradition and the whole point of why we have those sources of scripture the church and sacred tradition is precisely because we are we cannot access the holy spirit at will in the same way 
that we can access the scriptures or tradition or the church at will. Well, arguably tradition, but you know, it's just kind of like this amorphous thing that kind of just goes, but you get the idea. And that's the whole point of why we have these sources because very, because most of the time or very often at least, uh, it is extremely difficult for any individual to discern whether a thought they have is simply their own thought or a demonic thought or the Holy Spirit. But even if you could discern that a thought was good and in line with scripture, you can still kind of ask whether that was given to you by the spirit specifically, like revealed to you. I'm a charismatic, so I believe in that. Or if it's simply a good thought that is resultant from your regenerate nature. These are, it's, 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 it's very difficult at a bare minimum, which is why everyone would agree scripture, tradition, and the church are necessary in order to give clear cut answers as to what the Holy Spirit is saying. So that's what we mean by a rule of faith, a kind of source that we can consistently access and say, that's inspired. That's, uh, that's, that's led by the Holy Spirit that comes from the Holy Spirit in theory, in theory, in practice, obviously is a whole different question. And now likewise with infallible or inerrant, because I see a lot of these days, well, I Actually, uh, the scripture isn't infallible. It's an errand because infallibility is for an agent. And it's, and it's, I'm like, sh okay, shut up. Shut up. Who cares? You know what we mean when we say scripture is infallible, all right? Infallible, inerrant, tomatoes, tomatoes. I do not give a stuff, okay? So by infallible, we mean that something is by nature in itself unable to err. It cannot err. So the perfect analogy I heard, for example, would be from my buddy Potoma Potos, shout out, my favorite Danish Lutheran, and the only one I know really, that a phone book, that is totally without error. There are no errors in the phone book at all, but it's not infallible. Why? Because it's potential. There is, there is the possibility that in the creation of a phone book, an error comes about. And I'm sure that's happened once or twice in history, even amidst many other phone books that are otherwise totally without error. So the difference between something without error and something that's infallible or inerrant is quite simply that uh, infallible or inerrant things by their nature cannot err. So scripture by nature cannot err because scripture by definition is something that's breathed out by God. Can God cannot be without error. Likewise with sacred tradition and the allegedly infallible uh, church magisterium. Hey, Jack Ray, good to see you, buddy. Good to see you. What up? So that's what we mean by infallibility. And it's important, why I bring this up is important is because to simply say that someone or some writing or some counsel at a particular instance was guided by the Holy Spirit is not the same thing as saying they are necessarily at all times or at least at all times under certain achievable conditions are protected from all error by the Holy Spirit. Those are not the same assertions. I, as a normie, normie evangelicals and Protestants say all the time, this person was so good. Oh, that guy was so led by the Spirit. Oh, this preacher, the Spirit was speaking through him. Absolutely fantastic. We say that all the time, but that's not the same thing as saying that the Spirit perfectly is perfectly protecting someone or something from error at all times, or at least under all and under certain conditions, every time those conditions are active. That's really important because some people will point to how church fathers, for example, or even scripture will talk about the spirit guiding or leading someone or something and then say, oh, look, therefore they're saying that that counsel or that tradition was infallible and all that stuff, which is, it's not, that's simply not the case. There's more particular evidence in the scriptures for why, for example, the apostles are infallible. And that's clearly because, for example, when speaking specifically to them, the spirit will guide them into literally every truth. Um, but also whatsoever, just just whatever, blank, a blank check, whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. That's prophetic insight. And it's and it's an infallible type of one. It's a very specific promise God gives. So we, that's why we can see um, when scripture is talking about the apostles being inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, it's a very clearly infallible type of one and not like a generic type of inspiration of the spirit, which everyone grants, um, which nonetheless is not perfectly, how would I say it, perfectly manifests every single time in a certain individual or body or whatsoever. That's why I bring that up. So when we are certain fallible, we are saying that something by nature at all times or under certain conditions, every time those conditions are fulfilled, are infallible. 
That's what we mean by that. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much that. <laughs> it's not, I told you this wasn't going to be a super long stream, but uh, this, this is pretty much my concept for ecclesialism. And, and so I'm not going to be going into the critique with this stream. I think I mentioned a couple of times before, I won't be critiquing in this stream or rather critiquing ecclesialism or the, in this stream or applying the arguments against Sola Scriptura uh, to ecclesialism in this stream. This one was simply just to define the concept, what I mean by it, be specific, have details about it. The next part, which will probably be next week, will be or the week after. If you're in, if you're in the night, if you're on the other side of the world, and it's Sunday right now, uh, either the end of the coming week or the week after, e either one of those. Uh, that will be the second part of this, where I will then uh, apply the arguments leveled against Sol Scriptura. Uh, most commonly, for example, of Sol Scriptura, so many people hold to it, and yet they're all divided, and apply that consistently. To ecclesialism. That'll be the next part. That'll be the next stream. And that'll be the more spicy one. This one was simply defining the concept. And I guess I'll wrap up with this. I'll have QA. Of course, I have a QA right after I finish here. But I believe and I really hope that this is this represents a true development in Protestant apologetics, in Protestant dialogue. Uh, because we now have, in my opinion, a very neatly package conceptualization of Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox systems, which is much easier for us to point at and critique. And so I, it is my hope that Protestants, even if they don't use the term ecclesialism, just apply some term to it because the easiest way for us to use and talk about categories is to have a specific term attached to them. That's why we do that. So I hope that Protestant scholars, apologists, thinkers, all that jazz, that they adopt this category as something to critique alongside Sola Scriptura, a counterpart to Sola Scriptura that can thus be critiqued. And it's extremely important because I believe part of the confusion brought about by comparing Sola Scriptura to the Roman Catholic Church, for example, or just not having anything to compare it to at all, uh, that's what has allowed for, in many areas, for Roman Catholics to really have the edge in certain arguments at least in terms of public appearance and rhetorical advantage, because they have something clear they can point to and say, that's wrong. Whereas us Protestants, we've never really had something neatly packaged as a concept like this to say, that's wrong. Well, okay, apart from like Roman Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy, so as ecclesial bodies and full theological systems, sure, we've had that, but those are pretty big and elaborate, whereas Sola Scriptura, and that's why many of those arguments devolve into insane nuance, uh, like nuance bro and all that. Whereas Sola Scriptura is a very simple premise and so it's very easy to critique. But now, likewise, we have the same here. If Protestant thinkers and apologists can adopt this, we now, likewise, have a very simple premise and idea to address. Yes, we've attacked, um, what's, uh, not attacked, I'd say, but critiqued the ideas of apostolic tradition or the church before as distinct. That's great, but... There's particular arguments leveled at Sola Scriptura, which make simply putting them against the church or sacred tradition, it, it won't really work because they're not going to, Roman Catholics aren't going to say that strictly speaking, the church or sacred tradition uh, is the sole infallible rule of faith and it's sufficient for everything. They're going to say that all three of these rules together, these are the complete three-legged stool of infallible divine authorities. And so putting it together as one concept will be the will be will make some very easy package, a very easy target, so to speak, for us Protestants to now actually critique and compare to Sola Scriptura. So I hope that was very useful. And I think that's about it for now with the whiteboard. Let me turn the computer back around. All right, and let me open up the window again for light. And bring the camera back down. Okay, sweet. <clears throat> so, um, let's see what questions we have or whatever. Who first came up with the phone book analogy? Maybe Sprawl. I don't know about Sprawl, but I first heard it from Potama Potos, my, uh, Michael or Mikkel Potama Potos in his channel. I highly recommend him to you guys, by the way, especially if you're Lutheran or if you're interested in studying Lutheranism. Uh, truth unto godliness. Really, really good guy. Really good channel. And uh, yeah, I, I collab with him. I want to collab with him again. 
Um, yeah, so there you go. Justus, Christ only promised to guide the apostles into all the truth. John 16, 13, very true, King. Josh, do you believe there are valid sources of rule of faith that are authoritative but not infallible? In a sense, yes. In a sense, yes. I think that is possible. So I think, for example, that Clement of Rome is to some degree an authoritative interpretive source for the Apostle Paul. And I have actually in practice used him that way um, on, on multiple different topics, including, let's say, sorry, including, for example, uh, gender roles, egalitarianism, and what it means for uh, Christians to be in mutual subjection to one another. I think given that he's in the exact same time, same language, same place as Paul sent his letter to the Romans, and very likely knew him personally, and that he very, very clearly, strongly replicates Paul's language in categories. I think he is a very, very authoritative source, not infallible, but a very authoritative interpretive source uh, for uh, for the Apostle Paul's own letters, because I'm using him just as a historian would use histor any other historical context. In, in, in a way, historical sources and contexts uh, relevant to a source we're looking at are authoritative. So like, for example, the, Eastern, the ancient Near Eastern worldview and metaphysics is in some way authoritative in interpreting the Old Testament because it explicates the categories with which the, uh, with those in ancient Israel that they were working with. And so likewise with Clement of Rome, for example. Okay. I'm not sure Catholics would say that tradition or the magisterium are infallible, though they can be authoritative except the Pope when speaking ex cathedra, which is why you need to go in a little bit of detail. I, I'd say that the that's why I specified um, either at all times infallible or under certain achievable conditions are infallible. So yes, that's true. The magisterium in Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy, I, I think, can give binding, authoritative, but reversible, not strictly infallible decisions, but they can under certain achievable conditions um, say with absolute certainty, this is infallible. And so that's what I mean by that. That allows for some nuance. It's the same. It's the same as with sola scriptura, because different groups who adopt sola scriptura have different conceptions of exactly what that means. So, if someone tried to disjunct it and say, "No, we don't all hold to the same idea of ecclesialism," well, no, sorry, but not all Protestants mean the exact same thing by sola scriptura either. So, there you go. Some some Protestants who claim to hold the sola scriptura are just frankly straight up prima scriptura. Like I don't think. Like many Anglicans, for example, will say that the ecumenical councils were infallible. I don't think that can be, they their position can coherently at that point be called sola, yeah, sola scriptura. And yet they're lumped in with the rest of us Protestants. So eh, there you go. Can you give your definition of rule for faith, rule of faith, please? Yes, I'll bring it up again. So rule of faith in how I am using it in this definition, okay? So I'm not saying this is how it's always been used or how others use it. How I'm using it in this definition Um Really, if anything, it may be better if I say source of faith or source of defined truth, but whatever. By rule of faith, I specifically mean a source that we can consistently discern and access at will for divine truth, divine infallible truth, I guess I'd add, inerrant truth. Um, but yeah, so that's that's what I mean by rule of faith here, just to, just to make sure it's particular because someone like, oh gosh, someone like, for example, um, how to be Christian, Ferris, they'll say that Protestants... Protestants say that only so that only scripture is infallible, but that's false because God is infallible. The Holy Spirit is infallible, which is an utterly retard brain dead take because these are not in the same categories that we're talking about. We're talking about in the categories of sources that we as humans consistently access material sources. Yes. Sola Scriptura is the sole infallible rule of faith. And that's derived, of course, from the supernatural source that is God. And so it's not the same thing. That's why I that's why I specifically define rule of faith here in case someone decides to do the how to be Christian hermeneutic and just be a jackass and uh, try to split hairs. Reform dweeb, who would fall under the umbrella of ecclesialism? So that would be at minimum Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy. And potentially, potentially as well, the highest echelons of Anglo-Catholicism. They could probably fall under that as well, um, which would which adds to the problem of why all Anglicans are lumped in as Protestants by Roman Catholic apologists. So yeah, uh, that would be Roman Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, highest levels of Anglo, Anglo Catholicism, uh, pretty much all the traditional apostolic sects that, uh, that uh, emerged before the Protestant Reformation, for example. So that'd be like the Orientals, for example, the Assyrian church of the East. Although I say that with qualification because I have heard someone say that, 
um, that the Orientals don't believe ecumenical councils are infallible. I've heard that said, although I've heard someone else say to the contrary. And ecumenical councils are like the main manifestation of tradition and magisterium. So that'd be interesting if they even do fall under ecclesialism. Um, but yeah, so that's 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 who I'd include. At bare minimum, Roman Catholicism, Eastern Nazi, but I, I guess also the other minor groups like the Sede Vacantis, for example, like the, the Diamond Brothers um, something monastery, I forgot what they're called, the Old Catholics who split after Vatican I, numerous other groups and, and sects. There's many who adopt the, the general idea of ecclesialism. Mormons and JWs. Um, Mormons, uh, Mormons are a tough one now because there's at least a very popular movement within them basically saying their prophets can receive revelation, but they're not infallible. Like that's getting really, really popular now. And so it's, I, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure. If you wanted to expand ecclesialism to say, well, I, I guess if you put the 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 idea, if you apply the the sub definition of infallible, the church magisterium infallible under certain achievable conditions, then maybe. But I don't think even Mormons have defined that. Um, but they are capable, at least the prophets of Mormonism, of uh, the prophets of Mormonism are at least capable of providing infallible truth so if i yeah, it's a it's a tough one it's a tough one um but, well rather they're, they're capable of receiving and promulgating public revelation which i think that's a that's really a different discussion altogether because we're talking about um perceivable consistent certainty of an infallible statement uh, how would you actually, I'll address this first. That's right. The Oriental Orthodox do not hold that the ecumenical councils or the church is infallible. Um, yeah, I've heard that, but I don't, I don't know. Cause I've heard others say, I've heard, I've heard others say to the contrary. Um, but if that's the case, then, uh, based Oriental Protestants based, based, although they probably hold to a concept of apostolic tradition, which is infallible, but I, I've always held anyway that like given the primarily fundamentally um ethereal abstract form of sacred tradition there's it's utterly meaningless to say that exists and yet you don't have an infallible explicator of that abstract tradition um because in a sense us protestants say well yeah there there is in the abstract an infallible set of truths a tradition if you will uh but the question is how what sources infallibly promulgate that that's actually a different question <clears throat> Article 21 says councils may, uh, let me see that. Let's, let's fact check that, shall we? 39 articles of faith. 39 articles of faith. Uh, the Church of England, the authority of general councils, 21st, blah, 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 blah. Uh, general councils may not be gathered together without the commandment and will of princes, and when they be gathered together for as much they may err and sometimes have erred, even in things pertaining unto God. Well, here's the okay, yeah, I remember this one. Here's the thing. General councils, what are they? I don't think this is in reference, strictly speaking, to the ecumenical councils of old. Um, because we have, for example, in Australia, the General Synod. Um, that's that's often what it's called. And we just had that a few weeks ago. And so they're they're likely saying that those general assemblies of their divines, they can err, but they're not strictly speaking saying ecumenical councils of old. Can oh crap! Hang on. One second. Sorry, that's pretty much the best way I can explain because I know. Anglo Catholics, Anglicans who affirm, I was literally just talking with one on Twitter just before this, who affirm that the ecumenical councils are infallible. I think, I think Father James himself uh, affirms that. So yeah, I don't think Article 21 is talking about the ecumenical councils of old. Uh, yeah, there you go. Mormons and JWs are totally different religions. So that may be an unfair comparison, potentially, potentially. Um, but then again, that's, that's another problem that the, the Catholic apologists will say, well, how do you define even a Christian, you know? And so if they want to, if they want to go that route, I mean, 
I mean, here's the thing: if they, if if the JWs and more, if hypothetically some other wacko sect, which none of us affirm are Christian in the slightest, if it nonetheless affirmed that sacred scripture, um, sacred apostolic tradition, and the magisterium of the church that Christ established are infallible, then it could be comparable, I guess. I mean, hey, why not? Because we're doing. I mean, hey, we, we we can we can come up with our own categories for critiques. So there you go. <laughs> oh man. Uh, Agorif G is there at least Christian subgroups from the outside looking in with a magisterium that tells you stuff. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I'd agree that otherwise the, the the Mormons, from what I know, they probably don't fit under ecclesialism. They're they're, they're just their own breed, pretty much their own malformed breed. <laughs> um, yeah. And the JWs, um, I don't. Well, they'd hold to their Watchtower their Bible and Tract Society, I guess, as like, you must believe us or else. I don't think they believe in an abstract tradition. So like they're at least partially ecclesialist, I guess. Um, yeah, whatever. Um, they're definitely, uh, actually, I will say JWs are definitely solar ecclesia in some way. Yeah, because solar ecclesia is another way it's been used. And I think solar ecclesia has been a very, uh, a very helpful way of bringing this about, but it gets stuck in the weeds of how, oh, we don't only really believe in the church, we believe in the scripture and tradition. And, and so I'm just, I'm just cutting through past all that crap and say, okay, here's a concept you can agree to. And now we're going to critique that. Hey, silhouette, my man. Good to see you. We need to meet up again. It's been, it's been ages because we are IRL friends. JWs and Mormons are pretty similar. Melorite cults to each other. Yeah. But I doubt to Rome and these. Um, they, I believe Roman Catholics can't define what a Christian is either though, after Vatican II, even us heretics are Christians. Yes, exactly. And, uh, it's still rubbing me so bad that I didn't get to bring up that point with Trent Horn in our discussion, because that was really one of the core critiques I gave that he could make that point. He could have had that argument before Vatican II that Catholics know for certain who's Christian and who's not, but with Vatican II, that it explicitly holds the possibility of salvation of non-Catholic Christians. Now we can ask the same boat. Well, okay, how, to what degree, what dogmas are a non-Romanist allowed to deny um, before they're damned? Because they already, by definition of not being communion with Rome, deny one or two dogmas at minimum. So what else are they allowed to deny? You don't have a definition for that. So under the exact same boat, which is why I propose that we do a second part. And it seems like Trent Horn sounded like he was, uh, he's open to that. Uh, although of course he's very busy. So maybe later in the future. Um, so I'll probably email him about that soon. Yeah. <laughs> Most Mormons are solar bosom burners. That's so true. I watched the debate, which really showed the modern state of Mormonism. Um, the debate at, uh, at Apologia Church with James White in that. Uh, oh, actually, do oh, well, Q and I guess this is a Q and A now. Q and A. So, any supporters who have questions, um, I recommend you send them in the in the supporter questions channel in the Discord, so I can see them apart from everyone else. And uh, but otherwise, if you give it here, then uh, yeah. So I'm terribly sorry, Elder Rich. I was supposed to. I, I should have addressed your question with priority, but I got slightly confused because it was in the main. It was in the main chat, and I forgot your supporter. So like, terribly, terribly sorry. This is why. This is why I highly encourage or really just straight up tell um, financial supporters to put it in the supporter questions discord so I can clearly see it apart from everyone else. But uh, anyway, I will put some serious effort into this because you are a major effort because you are a supporter. So how would you take First Clement 44 where Clement outlines apostolic succession for the office of bishop? Would you say this is an office of authority but not divine guidance the apostles had? Uh, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. He Clement simply says the apostles created a permanent office so that once a certain holder dies, others take their place. That's it. It's a very simple assertion. It's not, it's something that ask a Baptist, do they believe that, that the apostles established uh, offices of shepherd that have the, that, that are permanent so that when someone in the office dies or abdicates, someone else takes their place. Yes. No one disagrees with that. No one, which should force them to ask, well, hang on. Is this really apostolic succession? Then? Because apostolic succession in the Roman and Eastern systems, and, and to be fair, Lutheran and Anglican systems as well, is a much more particular claim that I liken to basically the, the sacerdotal, the sacramental baton. All right. It has the idea of not merely that the offices are permanent and they have successes, but that there must be material continuity between all successes and, and that there's a spiritual validity conveyed, be, uh, conveyed through that. That's a much more particular 
and and uh, padded up assertion. So and and Clement doesn't explicate that at all. Um, not to say that's not the same thing as saying therefore he didn't believe it. I'm not I'm not a I'm not an atheist historian. Oh look, silence. Therefore, it doesn't exist. No, no. Um, I have other arguments for why I think Clement doesn't actually hold the idea of a sacramental validity, but that's, that's, that's a whole, that's another discussion entirely. The mere silence of that doesn't disprove it, but it does show that that passage isn't proof for apostolic succession as, um, as typically defined. So I hope that was a good, hope that was a good answer. Um, oh, here we go. Supporter questions. Jack Ray, my priority. Oh wait, as a question, my priority question mark. Well, I'll, I'll read comments as well, I guess, in the supporter questions thing. Maybe I'll re rename it to supporter comments. Um, but yeah, my priority. How good, Jack? How good? But uh, yeah. Mm. Oh, my thing is empty. Come on. Uh, I'll take a. I'll take a few more questions and comments, and then I'll and then I'll finish up. This isn't going to be a long stream. Um, but I guess while I'm waiting for questions and comments, I am going to be seeing Top Gun Maverick today, which is super awesome. And for my fellow Aussie guys, I am seeing it at Hoyt Cinema Extreme Screen. So the real experience. And it is going to be unreal. I cannot wait. I've heard that movie is absolutely incredible. Some people saying it's equal to or greater than the original. And that's just an amazing experience. So I genuinely can't wait. And I can't wait because... This has, if my counting is correct, and it, and it shocks me, really, this would be the first time I've been to the cinema in like two years since the lockdown crap started. And so that is like exciting. Or maybe a year. I forgot. Maybe I saw something after. But I am genuinely excited to to see it. It's going to be super epic. And uh, yeah, we'll be doing the classic thing where me and my bro, we're going to, we're going to pick up our snacks from Woolies. I'm not going to buy cinema snacks because that's an absolute flipping ripoff. Buy our snacks from Woolies. Oh, sorry, Woolworths, which is basically... What's the equivalent of Woolworths in America? Um, basically, your supermarket franchise chain. Big supermarket franchise chain. So, uh, not really Walmart. Um, yeah, yeah. Super, supermarket grocery franchise chain. That's what Woolworths is. That's what it is. So... Uh, yeah, we'll be getting our snacks from there, and uh, I'm hyped. I am genuinely hyped. Ooh, ooh, I know, I know. Indig has a question there, but I see Elder Ridge in the in the chat. Uh, sorry, in the Discord server was typing a question, so I'm gonna wait for him. Will I start in America? Really now? Really? I hope not, because they're our fr they're our fresh food people. Like Woolworths are uh, Australian identity. Um. Oh, my friend's, sorry, met, friend sent a message. Top Gun with fam. Okay. Doesn't exist here anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We took it. Oh, here we go. From Elderidge. Okay. Um, I'll, so what I normally do is like, is like copy it from the Discord and then um, and then post it here. I want to find a way if StreamYard can see comments from like another third party app, which I can then add my supporters to and then like actually highlight it. So from Elder Ridge, my supporter. What's your response to Sola Scriptura being self-refuting? Um, well, it depends on what variant of the argument that you bring up. And uh, to which I'd simply say, uh, which I simply say, well, it, dep it depends on it depends depends on the argument. Uh, the normal one, I guess, is Sol Scriptura is self refuting because it doesn't have the canon, uh, which has the underlying assumption that you must have an infallible definition of the canon, which I think is just an utterly unproven assumption. It's ridiculous. God has operated and guided people through fallible means and does to this day. Uh, we have our Bibles today by means of fallible scribes and manuscripts, which has a material effect. Text critical studies exist. Um, and of course, the by God's providence, the vast majority of variants are meaningless, but some do have some effect. And yet we can trust by God's providence that his essential message and even in its details is preserved to us by fallible means. We accept that today until like, and Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox have to accept that until the day when they infallibly define a textual base. 
for their Bible and a translation, not not to mention because that's another fallible thing. So so it's it's so that argument doesn't hold water because we accept uh, because it relies on an assumption which no one actually holds um, except the most radical epistemic nihilists. And so, uh, yeah, we, so I freely grant our knowledge of the canon. The canon itself in its ontology is infallible. It is a divine truth. It is an artifact of revelation. The mere fact that God inspired some books and not others created, at least in his own mind, a canon. Our knowledge of the canon is transmitted by fallible means. And yet by God's providence, we have very high certainty on, at bare minimum, the very core books where really most of our theology comes from. The debates come over certain edge books, like let's say the Catholic epistles or really the Apocrypha to be to be real, and perhaps even Esther if someone wants to throw that in. And yet, even if we even if we granted, even if we said for the sake of argument, we have absolutely no certainty on those books at all, which I don't think is the case, but even if we did grant that, the books that we do have extreme high moral certainty on are pretty much all we need. So that's not a so it's actually not a big deal for me. <clears throat> um so it's a, it's a premise that is unfounded because if someone it would only be it would only be the case if a protestant granted that there must be an infallible that that scripture that there must be an, an infallible material source for the canon of scripture but even then one could simply say um yeah the mere fact the mere fact that something is scripture irrespective of the certainty of our knowledge of it um that is uh that is basically saying that it is of the canon. So a bit of a roundabout way, but I, I hope that answers it because it doesn't, because otherwise it doesn't make sense. <clears throat> the The epistemology just doesn't make sense. The new Top Gun is a psyop to get people involved in Ukraine. <laughs> it's, the, it's the ghost of Kiev, guys. Tom Cruise is the ghost of Kiev. <laughs> oh, man. I refuse to watch Jurassic movies. They don't comprehend what made the original good. That's true. Also, CGI is gay. No, it's not CGI. There are many movies where you see where CGI is used and you never even notice it. Um, like, the, like for example, Mad Max Fury, Fury Road. You know those canyons they were driving through? 100% CGI. And uh, and you probably didn't notice it if you watched it. <clears throat> but apparently with Top Gun Maverick, uh, Tom Cruise refused to use any green screen or CGI, at least for the most part. Uh, at least in the vast majority of cases, which is amazing if that's the case. Can't wait. Uh, and then <laughs> Elderidge also asks, do you have any oil or a beard oil or product? Because it looks beautiful. Well, thank you very much. This is actually the most messy it's been in a long time. I need to, um, I need to get a, tr I need to get a trim again. It's just that I'm not very good myself and my trim is like, I still need to recharge it, but I, I just honestly just need to go to another hairdresser, but I'm tight on money. So it's not the most usable, but thank you. I'm glad it looks good at the moment. I haven't used product for a while though. No. So no, that's the, that's the funny part. <clears throat> um, yeah, there you go. There you go. Oh, whoa! Hello, Elderidge. Did you just turn to? Did you just went? Did you just go Diakonos just like that? Hang on a second. Hang on a second, brother. Oh my word, you did, Bruh. I don't know what to say. You are, wow, just like that. You are an absolute legend. Thank you so much. Literally, just live on air, Elderidge just went into Diakonos tier right now. Subscribe star down below, people. Let me bring up the um the banner. Dang, how good, how good. Thank you so much, man. Seriously, I, I hugely appreciate it. So much, so much. Um, okay, let's see what else. Oh, yes, a go for Jesus. Very true. Go to my soul scriptura playlist in my channel. Deal with that charge from various angles. Very true, King. Very true. <clears throat> Occasional videos. General does mean ecumenical. Look up the Jerusalem Declaration for the Anglican view, specifically of the second seven ecumenical councils or the fundamental declaration of the province of the ACNA. Well, if that's the case, then a bunch of Anglicans I know are, well, they're uh, <laughs> they're sorely, sorely misled. So there you go. There you go. Oh, absolute legend. Mad Max is always the counterexample, but I'm just sick of it replacing actual props and costumes. Yeah, no, yeah, no, very true, very true. It's when CGI is done bad that it's criticized, as it should be, when it could very easily be done by props. But even when CGI is done well, you can still kind of tell when it's CGI and when it's a real prop. And so real sets and real props, like they, they, they add that authenticity to it. The Arkanos game. That's right. I've got, uh, on my server, I've so far, I've so far got two deacons. How good. Two deacons, uh, two bishops and three patriarchs. How flipping good. How flipping good. I haven't watched and don't plan to watch, uh, TG2 already involved in Ukraine. 
<laughs> Base. Uh, ooh, uh, wasn't the Vulgate considered authoritative by Rome for a while? Yes, it was. That was actually something I did a bit of a dive into. The canon on Tre on the canon of the Council of Trent concerning sacred scripture, or the decree rather. And I had the there was there was a genuine contention by some Protestants, and I think myself once, or at least when I first found it, but I, I've since abandoned it. That the uh, that they considered that it, it in it in an ecumenical council, it infallibly decreed the Vulgate to be the base of uh, to be the to to be. Um, like the sacred scripture itself and particularly the edition published by, I want to say Pius V or the 16 Clementine Vulgate that when, when it eventually got to that, the, ba the basic problem was that they infallibly decreed a very, very, very fallible text type, which they eventually changed up. Um, <clears throat> but I since otherwise looked deeper into the, into the context of it and like act, what the, the decree itself actually said, and there was a good argument raised at Call to Communion, I think, Call to Communion, a Catholic blog, I think by Joe Heschmeyer, where he said, no, it's not saying that the the six time, the, the edition of the Vulgate by Sixtus or Pius V, I think it was Sixtus, uh, it's not saying that that is infallible or any edition is infallible. Um, that was the juridical decision part of the decree, which I saw and I was like, okay, yeah, that's fair point. That's fair point. Um, so, yeah. Um, da, 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 da. Ooh, author Chog, did you know Lost Ark is now free to own on Steam? Lost Ark, what's that? Let me let me check. Lost Ark, Ark expansion. Oh, it's an expansion to Ark Survival Evolved. What is that? So, huh, that's cool. <laughs> I don't play Ark Survival Evolved, so yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and yes, that's right. Uh, Militant Thomas is doing a stream on the authority of the Vulgate soon. I, I that's going to be very interesting because, like, depending on his conclusions, that could have some very interesting implications. Because Trent otherwise does affirm the authority of the Vulgate, and then, uh, but then Pope John Paul II comes in and is like, "Yeah, nah, huabam, nova vulgata." Oh, sorry, nova vulgata, the ecclesi the ecclesiastical aberration of the Latin language. <laughs> Um, but yeah, <clears throat> so it's very, it's very, very interesting. It does the, the whole thing of fallible of the reliance on fallible manuscripts and fallible, um, and fallible, uh, uh, translations is a big problem with the epistemic nihilist form of the argument <clears throat> and, uh, or, or even the more sophisticated form of the argument where like, sure, you can have epistemic certainty, but that doesn't. Um, that doesn't mean divine divine binding of an interpretation of it. You could apply that exactly the same. Well, you guys don't have a divinely bound uh, edition of scripture, for example, or, or a divinely, uh, divinely bound text type, divinely bound translation. And so, and they'll often dodge it by simply saying, well, it doesn't matter because just what we need to believe, that is divinely bound, to which I simply say, that's nice. But now you're leaving Roman Catholics for the vast majority of their Bibles in the dark, uh, divinely speaking, as to how to as to uh, as to what passages mean. You force if 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 a Catholic, for example, sees a passage that seems to very strongly um, irk against uh, a Roman Catholic doctrine, sure they can get instruction and guidance and nuancing and interpretation by their authorities, but without a explicit infallible statement on that passage, and in particular an infallible textual uh <clears throat> especially if there's a variant in that passage an important variant an infallible textual uh form and an infallible interpretation absent of those they're going to still be relying they're still going to be basing their faith on very fallible means in, in in certain respects it's a rough way of putting it and i can easily develop it more it was a blog post i made a long while ago on my blog um basically detailing how much stuff rome has left things to be fallible so you know Reformed Presbyter, lovely to see you, lad. Every argument I've heard in favor of ecclesialism is aimed at trying to get a person to agree that they cannot comprehend what they're reading. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Um, I'd say not every now. There's there's more there's more sophisticated ones out there. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, but yeah, they often do still come across that way. BDW, uh, by the way, Kalustos Ware, Orthodox Metropolitan, kind of agrees to Sola Scriptura in one of his university speeches. Based, based. 
They may correct in saying the first four are inerrant in the sense of true. Well, that's not really what inerrant means. That's a, that's the thing. Uh, da, da, da. Once a person agrees that they comprehend, they can't comprehend what they read in scripture, they'll go along with just about everything. That's true. That's true. Rome changed its doctrine how I changed my underwear once a decade. <laughs> <laughs> oh man i feel many people believe in the need of it for an infallible interpreter because lacking the holy spirit they can't make heads or tails of it and that's something why i've only i've kept that like at the back of my mind but frankly i can't dispute that possibility you and we shouldn't um dismiss that possibility there may genuinely be well, if you're if you're a hardcore Protestant, you have to believe this. You have to believe this. But there may be very many Roman Catholics who truly don't have the Holy Spirit, and so they read Scripture and it's just unintelligible for them. Or if they try to make sense of it, it just it just it's just all gobbledygook. So that's a possibility we can't dismiss. We we really can't. We really can't. Uh, is there much else to do, or is that pretty much it for? Now, I think that's pretty much it for now. Um, yeah, yeah. There's the um, I've grown sick of the whole infallible and the with a and all that. Those those kinds of arguments, like I've I've grown sick of them very much. Um, and so I'm pretty much laying off them for now because they always end up going in circles. And God willing, my ecclesialism definition here will be very useful for everyone and I'll be using it myself. But otherwise, I want to steer clear of the whole, you need more infallible interpreter, blah, blah, blah. Um, both in the in the crappy, popular, nihilistic form of the argument, but also the more sophisticated form brought about by the likes of, for example, Brian Cross. Um, <clears throat> and so, but which I do intend to critique at some point, the more sophisticated argument, which I've got, I've gone back and forth with, with a couple of people a um, couple of Roman Catholic guys online about it and it got pretty heated, but uh, hopefully we're still on good terms. And, um, <clears throat> but I do intend to critique that Brian Cross argument about which, which in some it's really convoluted, but in some the Protestant only has only has only knows and has interpretations of scripture and that, and which are fallible and they're not in the Protestant system. Their interpretations are themselves not divinely bound um, and so therefore that's a problem. Whereas with Roman Catholicism, we have interpretations that are infallibly bound. Um, <clears throat> and so you must believe them. Whereas the Protestant doesn't have any ground to really say you must believe this interpretation because the interpretation itself is not um, divinely said. You must believe that interpretation. And then he'll say other sophistry like in the Protestant system, you only find interpretations of Christ. Whereas in the Catholic system, we really find the person of Christ himself, which is just utterly utter sophistry. And uh, so I'll, I'll deal with Brian Cross's argument one day because it did really get on my nerves when I was arguing with some people on it and I could see how many people fall for it. And so, uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, there you go. There you go. I'll address it one day. It'll have to be stupidly in depth. Uh, but one other person who I do know addressed it would be uh, Jerry Walls um, as... <laughs> As incorrect he is on other issues, he he did a pre fairly decent response to it in his book, um, Roman but not Catholic. <clears throat> um, I asked Michael Lofton, don't we always end up with an authority that needs to be self-authenticating based? This was his response. No, once you have subjectively concluded that Christ gave us an objectively identifiable magisterium with an objective way to definitively intervene in theological disputed in theological disputes, then the self-authentication cycle ends. Um, uh, I mean, okay, but I mean, okay, to be fair, I don't know Michael Lofton's whether he adopts the cringy or oh, you need the infallible interpreter to bind an interpretation, which is which is a retarded argument, by the way. Interpretations are divinely binding by their nature because they're true. And they are true in the mind of God. They are <clears throat> they are true of what he says. So the whole idea that you need, that an interpretation needs to be directly bound by a, by a magisterial authority in order for it to bind the conscious. No, that's dumb. That's, that's actually really, really dumb. Because the meaning of a passage, the, the meaning of a text, for example, is, is the same thing as saying as an interpretation. That's everything. All interpretation is 
simply gleaning out the meaning of a passage or a text. So to say that a text is divinely bound, binding, but interpretations are not, unless someone else binds them, is actually retarded <laughs> when you think about it. It really, really is. So we Protestants simply say, well, so when someone, for example, asks, well, what what divinely binds, um, how, why is the Trinity divinely binding? Because we don't have the full concept of the Trinity in scripture. So how can you say that we are bound to believe the Trinity, but uh, that, that, well, let's say Jesus is God because nowhere explicitly says exactly that Jesus is God. And so how do you bind that interpretation on Unitarians if the scripture never says explicitly? It says, because that is that is the necessary entailment of scripture. It is true. It is the true interpretation of scripture on this question. And therefore, by nature of it being true, it is binding. That's it. The question of the ontology of an interpretation and its truth versus how we know about it are distinct questions. So I could grant, for example, that a magisterial system, Roman Catholic magisterial system, makes the Trinity in all its details much more explicitly clearer in infallible authorities than just scripture alone being infallible authority. I can grant that, but that doesn't actually, that only addresses the, the epistemology of it. That doesn't address the ontology of it. In the end, the mere fact we, it's in the, there's a whole, whatever, I'll, I'll move on. I'll move on now. So, uh, so yeah, I don't know Lofton whether he does the whole infallible interpreter argument. Um, but if he doesn't, then I, I kind of agree, I, I somewhat agree with it because in the end, everything does come down to the subjective conclusion. So one could subjectively conclude Christ gave us an objectively identifiable magisterium um, and an objective way to definitively intervene in theological disputes. Then the self-authentication cycle ends. All, I, I, I guess. But then in the end, how do you come to the... It's like, I don't think self-authentication is a cycle anyway. It's more so a basis, really. Um, yeah, it's not, I, yeah, I wouldn't treat self-authentication as a cycle. It's, it's just simply a basis. It's because I don't like when people, yeah, well, that's another topic. So I'd largely agree with this only, of course, as a Protestant, I'd simply say I subjectively conclude that Christ gave us his infallible words and all of them are preserved are only preserved in Holy Scripture. And so, yeah. You should debate Michael Lofton. You should debate Michael Lofton, yes. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'd be keen for it if he reached out. I'm not I'm not really one to reach out for debates often myself, with exception, with exception, with well, rare exceptions, rather. If I if I see that there's a debate I genuinely want to do, like like super, super want to do, and there's someone I super, super want to do with it, then I will do it. Um, otherwise, I, I'm keen for many debates, but I'm not like, not not mad fussed with reaching out myself. If he reached out, I'd well, depending on the topic, like if it's a topic that I believe I'm very sufficiently studied in and I'm willing to defend my my case for it, then yeah, yeah, I would. It'll, so it'll depend on the topic, really. I think that's about it. I'm probably going to call it now. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for watching. I hope this is a very educational stream. I hope it was enlightening. I hope it really advances the uh, dialogue. Share it with any Protestant, uh, partic particularly Protestant friends, uh, in order who who are who are wrestling with these questions, so that they can have some clearer categories in mind. Do a discussion on a debate. I, I'm I'm down for it. I could probably even reach out for a discussion. Yeah, I'd be down for that. Um, I, it would depend on the topic. If I see fruit for it, if I say need for it, I'm I'm definitely down for that. But I'd also be down for a debate if if he reached out. So yeah. Um, yeah. So thank you all so much for watching. I hope this is very clear. Share it with your Protestant friends, particularly. And, uh, if you're involved in these online dialogues, discussions, debates, then do please, uh, try to employ the concept of ecclesialism in order to bring equal weights and measures to the debate to hold the Romanists and the Orthodox by their own standards. And so, yeah, thank you all so much. I'm probably going to schedule gaming streams, a couple of gaming streams for this week plus uh, potentially an interview with a minister with an Anglican minister a local Anglican minister which I'm super hyped for if he if he gets back to me and some other things um yeah more announcements to come thank you all so much hope you all have a lovely day god bless